Um, welcome everyone to this talk. It's great to be back here after uh, three years of uh, not being able to go to, uh, to Spring I.O. My talk today um, is going to be about issues in production. And uh, as you can see, the title here is Heart of Darkness. Um, you may not all be familiar with the reference that I'm actually using here. So um, Heart of Darkness is actually the name of a documentary that I shot about making a movie called uh, Apocalypse Now from Francis Ford Coppola. I think the movie came out in 79 and it, it took them ages to actually do the whole thing and shoot the whole thing because the whole production was fraught with problems. Um, there were problems with the scripts, there were problems with the actors, there was problems with the weather. Um, I yesterday had my flight canceled. They actually got a helicopter crashing down on the set uh, as they were shooting. Um, just to put things in perspective. So uh, because so many things went wrong, uh, that was actually interesting enough that they made a full documentary about the making of the movie, and that is Hearts of Darkness. Um, this one is not going to be a filmmaker's apocalypse, which is the original subtitle of this thing, but this is going to be a spring DevOps apocalypse. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Failures in production, as I mentioned, and the, the motivation really for this talk was uh, this quote that I found from um, uh, Otto von Bismarck, a, a German general, who once said, only a fool learns from his own mistakes, the wise man learns from the mistakes of others. And well, uh, for today I'm going to be that fool for you, <laughs> because I have plenty of experience in, in doing things wrong and, and, and breaking stuff. So hopefully, indeed, at the end of this presentation, you will have learned at least to make certain mistakes uh, differently from how I have made them. Um, so my name is Joris Kuipers. I work as a CTO and hands-on architect for Trivork Amsterdam, which I've been doing now for a little over 10 years already. Um, before that, I used to work for SpringSource. So all in all, I have more than 20 years of experience in building enterprise Java applications and more than 15 years of experience with uh, Spring. So I'm an expert at many things, including failing and breaking stuff. Um, and that is, uh, like I said, the topic of today. So First couple of failure cases, which I'm going to discuss, are related to issues with the health of my applications. Because nowadays, I, and I'm sure a lot of you as well, um, are running your applications as services on some type of platform. Uh, very often that will be Kubernetes, uh, but it could be something else, but at least that platform will be responsible for deploying your applications and then making sure that your applications stay up and running. And for that, typically, you need to perform some sort of health check. Now, as you're probably aware, uh, Spring Boot provides a feature called the Actuator, uh, which provides all sorts of uh, features for, for uh, operating and managing and monitoring your application at runtime. And one of those is, in fact, a health check endpoint that's provided by default on slash actuator slash health. So you make a request to that, and if your application is OK, it will respond with a 200 OK and a little status that says, yeah, I'm up. And if it doesn't respond, or it responds with a 503 and it says I'm down, then there's a problem. So that's typically used by something like a load balancer or your orchestrator to see, okay, uh, can this thing actually serve some traffic or should I maybe restart it or something like that. Um, the way that this works in Boot is that uh, this health status is basically uh, a combination of all of the health statuses that are provided by a set of so-called indicators, a health indicator. Uh, out of the box, Spring Boot ships with a number of health indicators. So there is one that simply always says, yeah, I'm up. That's the ping indicator, just so that there is one at least. Uh, but more interestingly, there are health indicators for checking if you have some free um, room on the file system. Uh, there is one for checking if you can make a connection to your database, if you can connect to Elasticsearch, if you're using that, and all sorts of other things. And obviously, uh, Boot being a framework, uh, you can build your own health indicators as well. Now, um, the case that I'm going to present first is uh, one that is uh, from my current project, but that project actually started already almost five years ago. And this was around the time that Spring started to come out with the very first support for building reactive applications, uh, which actually would have made sense for the type of use case that we're doing, because we're mostly doing a stateless integration platform, lots of transformation and routing. Uh, but it was a bit too soon at the time. There was no support yet from things like Spring Security, uh, Spring Cloud, all of that was still just on the blocking model. So this application 
uh, as I'm sure many of you are using as well, was just using the standard Spring MVC with an embedded Tomcat model, which means that you get a thread per request. Right? Every time that an HTTP request comes in, Tomcat assigns a dedicated thread for handling that request. You run your code on that. When you're done, thread is available for handling other requests again. Um, we were already deploying this in a containerized environment on AWS. At the time, they did not provide a managed Kubernetes uh, yet, or at least not in the regions that we were deploying into. So this was run on something called ECS, which is uh, the Elastic Container Service. It's like their, their own proprietary Docker orchestrator, which they are still actively supporting. Um, so what happened is this thing was part of a lottery platform. Um, me and my colleagues are, were doing some projects for the Dutch lotteries, Nederlandse Lotterij. Um, and um, one of the things that we support is players logging in so that they can perform some operations. So what happened is that we went into production with this thing and there was a state lottery draw. Now the state lottery draw is something that more than a million people in the Netherlands actually play with. Um, it happens at 10 o'clock in the evening and at 10 o'clock like the whole country wants to know what did we win or rather did we win something because if you want to run a successful lottery most people should not actually be winning. Um, but that means that the platform got sort of busy. And uh, because of all of these requests coming into our platform and us then pushing that down to the downstream service, um, one of the downstream services became a bit slow and unresponsive. And obviously, uh, that can happen. Um, so we got many requests in. Application was, uh, was, uh, was running successfully still. Everything was just on our side was fine. We were just doing a lot of waiting. And then um, all of a sudden, uh, the platform started killing off our applications. So we, just, we saw that they were being restarted. And it wasn't necessarily a, uh, tr a catastrophic breakdown, because we are running multiple instances uh, of every service. But it, it was causing some issues, some 500s. But it was mostly weird. Right? Our application was operating perfectly fine. Um, actually, it wasn't even doing that much, because well, it was mostly waiting for the backend. And then it got killed. So what actually happened is because this was a blocking application, uh, Tomcat allocates a dedicated thread pool. By default, it's 200 threads when you're using uh, Spring Boot to handle incoming requests. So every time a request comes in, you get a thread. And on that thread, we were making requests to a backend system, to a downstream system. That system we got slow enough that at a certain point for an instance of our service, all 200 threads were actually tied up. And they were uh, waiting. Right? So even though we thought our application is just uh, nicely busy, it's exactly as it says here, we're just busy working, uh, which actually means we're doing nothing. We're just stuck waiting on some backend to come back. And all of these 200 threads are just hung. What happens then is that when your load balancer comes in, it also uses an HTTP request. So the load balancer was coming into the service and saying, how are you doing? And the application said, yeah, yeah just hang on a minute. Uh, I'll get to you in a second, right? Just get in the queue. Um, and after a, after a while, that actually got bad enough that it took more than two seconds for the application to respond to a health check. And we were using a health check setting that says, well, if the application cannot respond to a simple health check within two seconds, <laughs> it's not healthy. So it was actually killing off our applications at the worst possible time, right? We were actively handling the, the maximum number of requests that we actually could. They were all in flight. Everything was operational, and still our services got killed off for not being responsive enough to actually handle a health check request. Obviously, that's bad, and it didn't really take very long to figure this out. But the question then becomes, once you know what the problem is, how do we actually fix this stuff? Now, what I did at first at the time is I, uh, we were using uh, the, uh, the Netflix uh, stack from Spring Cloud. Uh, by now, most of those. Uh, components are actually deprecated because they're no longer actively developed and maintained by Netflix and therefore also by the Spring Cloud team. But we were using Hystrix. And Hystrix performs circuit breaking, but it performs uh, another thing as well, which is called bulk heading. And bulk heading is a term that actually comes from, uh, from shipping. As you can see here, uh, when there is a leak in your ship, you don't just want the whole thing to run full of water and then sink. So instead, what you can do, you can build these bulk heads, which are compartments, basically, so that if there is a leak, only that one compartment floods, but everything else still stays afloat. Um, translated into software, what that means 
is that a bulkhead can uh, limit the amount of concurrent requests that you are allowed to make to a downstream system so that you don't overload that system when you are under high pressure. Now, most of our services uh, were just talking to a dedicated backend system, right? They were not just talking to like 20 different systems. So what we could do is we could use the bulk heading support to say, well, if we have 200 threads in the Tomcat request handling thread pool, and then we configure our um, Hysterix bulk heading to just allow 190 downstream requests, then when 190 requests are already active and there is another request coming in, we can immediately say, no, it's not going to happen. We don't have any capacity left to make a downstream request, so we'll fail. And that, that failure is really quick. So with the 10 threads that we would have left, we would have plenty of capacity to both handle incoming requests as well as load balancer requests, which was the whole point. Now, this worked, so that was good, but it was not really ideal. Um, first of all, uh, if a request comes in and the bulk head says there is no more capacity, you just get an exception. So you have to manage that exception yourself, and you need to figure out, okay, so what code am I going to translate this to to get back to the client, that sort of thing. There is no queuing mechanism or anything like this, so you can also not tell the client to just wait for a little bit. But most importantly, it's not very generic. This worked well for systems that were just talking to a single backend, so we could configure a single uh, Hystrix command uh, to have uh, a bulk heading maximum of 190. But if you are actually making different requests to different backend systems, this, this doesn't really work. So it was like a temporary solution. We used it for a while, but eventually we realized what we really want to do is we want to be able to say health check requests should just come in on their own thread pool in Tomcat. Because then that thread pool is never tied up in handling business requests, and the business requests have their own regular thread pool. Now, to have a dedicated thread pool in Tomcat, you need something that is called a custom connector. It is fully supported. And to have a custom connector running next to another connector, it needs to run on its own port. Um, at the time that I came up with this solution, we were still running on ECS, uh, not on Kubernetes. And actually, uh, as far as I could figure out, it wasn't really that easy to say on ECS, I want to expose one port as my public port to route uh, traffic to, but I also want to expose some other port, and I want the load balancer to use that one for health checks. But um, we have fully uh, migrated now to Kubernetes. And in Kubernetes, this is trivial, actually. If you want uh, to support uh, multiple ports uh, and then use one for the, uh, for the probes, basically, and another one for your regular ingress route traffic, you just do that. So this is eventually what we set off to do once we were ready to migrate over to Kubernetes. And the effect is what you can see on this slide. When you configure your um, deployment descriptor, um, you can simply say, I want my liveness check to happen on this custom port, in this case, 8888, where our default port was just the 8081. Uh, and you can write some code in boot to say, I want this additional connector to be registered. Uh, it's just a couple of lines, right? It actually fits on a slide. This is really the code that we are using for this. It's not even simplified for, for presentation purposes, um, except for the fact that I haven't actually hard-coded these numbers in my production code. But that makes it fit on a slide. But what you can see here is we can just create a connector, configure a port number. We can look up this uh, protocol handler to also say, I really just need a very small thread pool, and off you go. And this works. The question is, if we're doing this for our liveness check, should we also be doing this for our readiness check? Now, in case you're not familiar with how Kubernetes works, it basically has two different health checks. The liveness check simply checks, is your application there if it's alive? And if not, OK, it gets killed, and we start up a new instance, because something must be really wrong. The readiness probe, however, says, is your application ready to start handling traffic? And if it isn't, then it won't be killed, but it won't get request routed to it until it starts saying again that it's ready for that. The readiness probe is both useful to see when your application is done starting up, but you could also use it for other purposes. And the question is, do you want that here? If my application is busy with handling 200 requests and it has no spare capacity left, should I be calling in myself as ready or not? And it, there is no straightforward answer to that. I think it depends a lot on your use cases, on the average response time, on the clients, how they'll deal with this. Um, but the option, at least now, is there to also do this for your readiness probe. The interesting thing is that this idea of taking a connector and then running it on a separate port, 
Um, Spring Boot actually can do this for you, but then for all of your actuator endpoints. So what you can do is you can say, I want to run my actuator endpoints on a dedicated port, and you basically get what I showed you on the previous slide. You get a custom connector running on a custom port, and therefore also on a custom thread pool. Um, what I found, and I found this really interesting actually, is that um, in the release notes of Spring Boot 2.6, they say this. I'm not going to make you read the whole thing, but what it basically says is, hey, we have this feature where you can run these actuators on a custom port, but that could mean that when you go to the readiness endpoint, your application says it's ready when it's really not. So what we now actually support, that's what is in the release notes, is that you, if you're doing this, you can also make the actuator endpoints, the health endpoint in this case, available on another path on your main port number, just to avoid this issue where your application says it's ready, but it's really not. But what, what I find strange is, I've zoomed in a little bit here, is that they say you can do this for liveness and readiness endpoints. So this is like the exact opposite rationale for what I just have been explaining and why I wanted to have my own connector. Um, I would not advise you to actually do this for liveness endpoints because it will result in your services getting killed at exactly the wrong time. I'm not sure also why they why they mention this. Um, as I mentioned, it could actually make a, a ton of sense to do this for your readiness endpoints, but I think that's something you need to consider for yourself and also test by doing some actual load tests with your application and see how it performs under load. Um, but liveness, definitely something that you need to think about because you don't want your services to just be killed when they're actually just too busy to respond, right? I have compared this, because I'm also a manager in my job, to going up to a developer and saying, hey, do you got a second? And they say, yeah, just let me finish this, and say, oh, you're fired, right? That's basically what happens. You're saying, if you cannot just directly respond to me now, yeah, you must not be doing your job. And then, well, I don't think that's a nice idea. Um, also, just for further thinking, right, if once you understand this stuff, you, st you start to think, okay, but but what should I do, right? If, if my application is actually all the time at capacity, I need more capacity, right? I should spin up more instances of my application if this happens to be able to handle more incoming requests. Um, so I need to scale out horizontally. Now, a problem with this is that a lot of platforms, including Kubernetes, by default, they look at things like CPU and memory for this. They say, oh, your application is really busy, it's using a lot of CPU, or hey, it's starting to consume a lot more memory, let's deploy some more instances. The thing is, that doesn't really work very well for Java-based services, especially when they're just stuck on I.O. I'm not going to consume a ton more CPU if I just have 200 threads that are busy doing nothing. Right? I'm not, I'm not doing nothing doesn't actually take up a lot of CPU. Also, when you look at memory usage in the average Java application, it will vary a bit, but it's not just going to go skyrocketing um, when you're already using like the max heap size that you have configured. So these are typically not very good metrics for doing scaling. So what we actually do is we expose metrics uh, that include the number of threads that are currently in active use for Tomcat, um, and then compare that to the maximum number of threads available. And Macrometer, which is the library for uh, exporting metrics can actually do this for you. It turns out to be quite easy. All you have to do is you need to enable support for JMX in Tomcat, because otherwise Macrometer cannot obtain these metrics. And when you do this, there is a ton of metrics that will then all of a sudden be made available. Now what we do is we expose these metrics to a commercial service called Datadog. This is software as a service. It's a really nice product. I honestly believe that. It's also quite expensive, and they have a pricing model where the more custom metrics you have, the more you start paying. So when you simply enable this, you're basically just handing out money to a Datadog for storing a lot of metrics that, well, most of them you don't really care about. I'm interested in the thread-based metrics, but this thing, it will expose a ton more. So to prevent that from happening, you can customize this. Now, Right now, Macrometer doesn't really have a nice declarative way of saying I want to filter the metrics that I'm actually publishing to a third-party system. I think they're considering that at the moment. Uh, but for now, what you can do is you can just write a little meter filter like this, where you can just do this filtering yourself. So what we do is we say, well, first of all, we don't actually care about the additional connector that I just showed. So I only want to expose metrics from the regular connector, the one on 8080, not the one on 888. And then also, if it's a Tomcat uh, metric, 
uh, but it's not a Tomcat threat metric, just discard it. I don't need that. Right? And this is purely for cost optimization, but it's a nice one, I think. So that's the first case. And um, unfortunately for me, uh, this wasn't the only problem that we introduced when it came to health checks. Because what we actually have is we have a microservices architecture, which is sort of like what you see here on the right. We have a public service th that exposes an API to our clients, but typically um, that will call some private internal service that performs orchestration and adapts to backend services and stuff like that. And then that private service calls out to some third party backend that we don't control. And what we thought it would be a nice idea to say, well, if you're performing a health check, you can include details of the result. So wouldn't it be nice if we introduce a custom health indicator that, for example, on this level can actually tell us if this thing is also OK. And we'll also introduce one at this level that can say if this one is OK. So that then when we perform a health check request to the top service and we look at the details, we can basically see the entire slice. We can see if the entire stack is happy and if we are successfully able to make requests. Now, when you do that, uh, you do have to be aware of the fact, of course, that let's say that this thing is not there, or even this thing is not there, you're not going to report this service as being down. That would be stupid, because then everything would just be restarted as soon as an external service that's not even under your control starts to develop an issue. So I was very smart, I thought, and say, I'm going to do this by having a health indicator that reports a custom status, because you can do this. A health indicator can say I'm up or I'm down, but it can also just return something else. And if you do that, it doesn't count as a bad status. So your system will still respond to be up. But you can see that result in the details. That sounded like a really nice solution. So that's exactly what we set off to do. So for example, in the public service, I implemented this health indicator um, that says, well, I'm going to just make a, a REST call to my downstream service. So I'm actually going to call the health endpoint of the downstream service here. Store the results just as a, as a map. So it's JSON, so we can just do key value pairs there. Uh, but if anything fails there, if we're getting any sort of REST client exception, uh, we shouldn't report that we're down. So uh, what we do is we have this custom status here. We'll call it a downstream fail. Right? So I can see that there is an issue there, but my service will still be healthy. So this is what we set out to do. And we tested it, and it was actually really nice. It gave us really nice insights into the, the whole application uh, from the outside in, because that was another reason that we wanted to do this. Public endpoints were publicly available, so we could do a health check there uh, without having to be uh, in the cluster or anything like that. And we could see the whole thing. Um, and um, then we took it to production. Now, actually, we took it to production, and it worked fine. So that, that was cool. So I was happy with this. Uh, I had deployed this on production, and uh, everything looked good. I did wait a little bit, because, well, it, it was new. And then I said, OK, that's cool. I'm going home, right? Job done. Let's go. Now, I live in Amstelveen, which is a city just south of Amsterdam, 10 kilometers from work. So it's a bike ride home. So I, um, I sat on my bike, and I started biking. And I got a flat tire, actually. This happens every now and then, uh, especially then, because this wasn't a really old bike. I have a new one now. Um, and while I was, by, uh, while I was uh, walking home with my bike, I got a phone call from the operations team. And they said, hey, you just did a deploy today, right? I said, yeah, I did. And they said, yeah, yeah services are being restarted. I said, That's weird. Is there a problem with the back end or something? I said, oh, uh, it could be. But, but our services are being restarted. I said, oh, that, how can that be? Because I, I thought about this stuff, right? I had to figure this out. Downstream issues should not call my health endpoint to report down. So maybe it's something else. And I started to work out possible scenarios in my mind while I had to walk home. And then when I got home, I had a look. What happened is that that health indicator that you saw was actually using a REST template to call the downstream service. Now, in our platform, we configure the Apache HTTP client that is wrapped by the REST template to have timeouts. Because by default, these things don't even have timeouts, which is terrible default. Uh, but we use a timeout of 12 seconds for the sockets. So that means if we don't get a response back within 12 seconds, or at least the first byte of a response, then we time out. Um, we had a backend system that became slow after my deploy. It had nothing to do with my deploy. It was just the backend going bad. But then when we had these health checks that were also including a call to our backend system, well, they started to become slow as well, obviously. 
So what happened now is we're basically back into the same situation where a load balancer comes in, performs a health check request, and you say, yeah, yeah, I can actually handle your request. Uh, just wait a bit. I I'm trying to get the status of this backend system so I can tell you if I'm up. And it took longer than two seconds. So again, we got killed. So a couple of lessons learned there. First of all, and this is true for distributed systems in general, slow is way worse than unavailable, right? Unavailable just says, I, I cannot open a con connection. I can fail fast. It's pretty OK. Systems becoming really slow cause all sorts of complicated issues that you have to actively guard against. Um, but also, don't try to be too clever. Um, in this situation, we only had one health endpoint still in the old version of boot. And it was used for quite critical functionality in the load balancer being able to determine if your service is there. Right? By actually making it do other stuff as well, well, maybe you're mixing some concerns that you shouldn't really re be mixing. That doesn't say that this was actually a bad idea in itself, but nowadays you can actually group custom uh, health indicators into, uh, into groups that are made available on a dedicated subpath of slash actuator slash health. Boot does this automatically for the Kubernetes probes, so the liveness and the readiness one. Uh, but you can also do this yourself. So that would actually have been a good idea if it had been available at the time. Also, this is my little rant, at least for blocking HTTP clients, why is there no HTTP client that allows me to configure a per request timeout, right? Whenever I need different timeouts, I need to completely configure a different HTTP client, wrap it in a completely different REST template as a bean, and then use that in my code just so that I can have a different timeout. It makes things very, very heavy if we want to do this. But we actually do this quite a lot now in our platform because we're doing a lot of integration, and I do have different requirements for stuff like timeouts. Now, your own health is important, of course. But another thing that's important is the health of others. And one way to guard the health of downstream services that you're interacting with is to use circuit breakers. I briefly mentioned the term already. Uh, a circuit breaker is basically a pattern where you say, um, if we notice that there is a real issue continuing in accessing some backend, we're just going to give up trying for a little bit. We're going to back off, say, this is not going to happen. We know that there is a problem, so we can fail fast. That's a benefit. And we're not just putting more load on a system that is already struggling. We could also have a fallback, maybe. Sometimes that makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. But that's basically what circuit breakers do. Now, um, when you're using something like a REST template, you're making a request to a system that responds with a for something uh, HTTP status, like a 404 not found. Uh, that will be mapped onto an exception. And by default, when you get exceptions so often enough uh, from a method guarded by a circuit breaker, it will trip the circuit breaker, and it, it starts to prevent you from making more requests. We didn't want that for 400, because it means we're doing something wrong. It's, it's, there is no problem with the backend. So uh, to prevent for something exceptions from actually tripping our circuit breakers, we configured to ignore them. This is an example from our old code that was still using Hystrix. But nowadays, we're actually running on Resilience for J, which works basically in the same way. So you can configure ignored exceptions. So what we did is we said, well, if there is an HTTP client exception, that's OK. All right? Don't just trip because that happens. It means it's our fault. It's not their fault. Right? It's us, not you. Um, so this ran in production actually for quite a while already uh, with success. And then there was a problem with one of our backend systems. It started failing, or it became slow. I don't remember the exact case, but it, it, it developed issues. And as expected and as desirable, our circuit breaker started tripping. Now, what you see here on the right is two things, actually, in one. This is, first of all, the logo of Resilience for J, which is an open source Java project, which is the recommended replacement, actually, for Hystrix. But it's also a state diagram. Right, so allow me to quickly explain what we're seeing here. You're seeing three states. This is a circuit breaker in its closed state. And closed state means it allows requests to be made. Everything is OK. When there are continuing problems, this circuit breaker will actually change from closed state to open state. And if it's in the open state, it does not allow you anymore to make requests. It's just going to throw an exception saying, you cannot do this right now. There is a problem with the back end. Um, but of course, it only does that for a brief period of time. And then it switches from that open state to this half open state. And half open state means we know there is a problem, but you know what? I'm going to try it once more. Or maybe just you can configure what that is, but typically it's something like I'm going to give it one more try. So when a request comes in, we will actually attempt to call the backend. If it works, 
Then the circuit breaker concludes, okay, everything is okay again, and it goes back from half open state to open state. If it fails again, it just goes back into open state. This is basically the state diagram of a circuit breaker. So what happened is our system, had, our backend had some issues for a while, but they recovered. And then our circuit breakers, as expected, started to nicely go back to the closed state again, except for one. There was one circuit breaker that would just stay open, even though there was no problem with the call that it was actually guarding. And we couldn't really figure it out. And eventually we ended up restarting our service and then everything was okay again. But of course this was a real issue. So we started to investigate what's happening. Why did we have just this one circuit breaker that, that wouldn't, wouldn't go back to close anymore? And it turned out that we had a use case that involved a happy flow with an ignored exception. We were buying lottery tickets. That's one of the main thing you do as lottery, you sell tickets. Um, as part of selling a ticket, we allow clients to retry if something fails because we want to make this operation item potent. The way that we do that is the client passes in a transaction ID whenever they perform a purchase operation, and then we verify if this transaction already exists in the backend by making an HTTP request that actually returns a 404 if that transaction is unknown. So for the happy flow, that is exactly what will happen. Usually when clients make a purchase request, it is their first attempt, so they will not be a response when we say, hey, does this thing already exist? That only happens if they need to do a lot of retries because something timed out. So our happy flow included an ignored exception. And the way that I had understood ignored exceptions was that uh, that exception will just be treated as a success, right? You can ignore it, it's okay. Everything is okay. That's not actually what an ignored exception does. It turns out an ignored exception is fully ignored, like it never happened. So what happened is we were in this half open state. System in the backend had gone back to fully functioning. And we were making this request to say, hey, is this, uh, does this transaction already exist? And the backend says, uh, no, 404. So there was this ignored exception. And then the circuit breaker says, well, whatever. I'm still in half open state. Because there was no success for me to actually make me go back into the closed state. So this thing was actually not really kept in the open state. It turns out it was actually kept in the half open state forever. And um, that basically means we were, uh, this was our new state diagram, right? You have a half open circuit breaker, which of course is not very useful. So what to do? Well, first of all, don't guard methods where you know that they will throw an exception by having a circuit breaker on them with an ignored exception. It just doesn't work. And we had this with Hystrix, but I have closely looked at the codes for Resilience for J, and it works in exactly the same way, right? So this is an easy mistake to make. So don't make that mistake like I did. That's one thing. Uh, but another thing is you need to think about how circuit breakers work and how you want to apply them. In our case, we had a single backend system, but every request that we were making, every different request to the backend, because they su supported the whole range of REST APIs, uh, was actually guarded by a separate circuit breaker. So that allowed some circuit breakers to close again, but some, some other one to stay in this half open state. It, the question is, do you want that to happen? And th again, that is not an easy yes, no question. It, it depends on your use case, but it could make sense to say, well, this backend system is typically going to fail as a whole. Right? Everything is going to be slow, or they have always they have issues with their network, so I cannot access it anymore. In that case, it might actually make a lot more sense to say, I'm going to guard that whole thing with one circuit breaker, rather than with one per operation. That's something to keep in mind as you are designing these things. Another thing that we've noticed in general with circuit breakers is that they are really easy to shoot yourself in the foot with. So you need to really understand them properly. How do these things work? With Hystrix, for example, by default, uh, they run their operations on separate threads, uh, but you can convert that to a semaphore, so it just does a counter to do bulk heading. With resilience for J, uh, it doesn't, but then also the, just the separation between circuit breaking and bulk heading is much more nicely implemented actually in resilience for J. Also, like when does this thing actually trip? Does it count consecutive errors, or does it count how many errors there are in a given window of time? Resilience for J can do both. But is the default the thing that you actually want, or should you change this configuration? How long does it actually take when a circuit breaker trips before it, it allows you to try again? Resilience for j in this case actually has, I think, uh, not a great uh, default. I think it's something like a full minute. If this thing opens up, 
it waits for a full minute by default to say, I'm going to give it another try, which for a system like ours is way too long. It should be like five seconds or 10 seconds, something like that. Um, so this is stuff you need to learn and that you need to configure appropriately for your application. Because without doing that, you're better off just not using circuit breakers. You will just be doing denial of service attacks on yourself if you are misconfiguring your circuit breakers like I did. Um, also, life lesson learned, right? Everyone needs some success experiences every now and then to be happy. Right? This goes for circuit breakers as well, apparently. Um, to stay healthy, I should say. So, um, let me check. Uh, missing in action. So, this is a story about Chuck Norris. No, this is a story about metrics, actually. Um, that went missing all of a sudden. So, I talked about Macrometer before. Uh, Macrometer is this library that can, uh, that can publish metrics. And in general, um, metrics, for me personally, have been like a revelation. Uh, before Spring Boot 2.0, I had never really done much with metrics and systems that could store them, like time series databases. So it was mostly just logging to see what, what, ap what applications were doing. Um, ever since we started to use uh, Spring Boot 2 and Datadog, which is now like uh, four and a half years ago, we have been using metrics. And it's, it's a great addition to logging, right? Um, it, it just does pre-aggregated data that it sends like once every minute, for example. And Spring instruments uh, almost everything that is in Spring out of the box. So you get metrics from your MVC controllers, you get metrics from your REST templates, you get metrics from the JVM, and all of that stuff will just be published. So you can look at it, you can analyze it, you can put it in dashboards, you can do a learning on it. Really nice. So we had, were running this actually for a couple of years already, and we were super happy with all of that. And uh, again, I deployed a new release. But this time, it was actually not something where I added a whole bunch of new functionality. This was a straightforward release, some small, nice things in there, a little upgrade of Spring Boot, which automatically gives you some upgrades from the dependencies that Boot manages for you. And that was that. And also, this uh, release had been tested on staging, of course. right? So we knew it worked. So I deployed it, and uh, everything seemed to work. But then I got a call from one of our product owners. And the product owner said, hey, remember that nice dashboard that you made for me when I can actually monitor our backend system and we can see how many calls we're making? Yeah, according to the dashboard, we're now only making like uh, one-tenth of the calls that we used to make before you're deployed to that backend system. I said, whew, that's not good. But then I looked at some other things and some logs and I said, well, um, I'm pretty sure it's just the metrics that are wrong. Uh, no one was complaining. The system was working just fine. It's just that the metrics that it was reporting were way off. Um, here's an example of how off they were. This is a picture of, uh, of Datadog showing calls to our health endpoint. And these calls are super steady, right? This is the load balancer or Kubernetes. I think this was still on ECS, so it was the load balancer steadily making these requests. So it should just look like that. So this was before the deploy, then we did the deploy, and after that it was like this. Now, I said uh, it was like 10 times. Actually, it turns out that this was exactly one-eighth of the amount of original requests. And then when we started to investigate further, it turned out that for this particular service, where we saw these results, we actually had eight instances running on one AWS region. Fishy, right? Probably related. So the drop seemed proportional to the number of pods, or maybe this was already Kubernetes, then it was pods. Um, and the thing is, uh, we did test this on a staging environment, but that was running single instance pods, right? So you don't see this. If, if you divide one by one, it's still one. Nothing is wrong. Um, so that was one lesson. We did actually have a pre-production environment where we were running multiple instances, but no one ever really looked at it. And that's another really weird thing. This was like a new environment that actually our customer had asked us to support and set up. But because we are an integration platform, right? every provider that hooks up to the whole platform needs to have that dedicated environment. And not everyone did. So they weren't really using the new environment just yet. They were still using the staging one that had single instance. So we didn't see it before. But still, uh, that didn't explain anything. So um, because I knew that there wasn't really like a production issue, it was just metrics. I took one service that wasn't super critical and I just rolled it back to the previous edition to see what happened on production. And for sure, after uh, restoring the old version, the metrics came up to, uh, to level again. So it, it, it had to be something related to our deploy. It had to be in the code. 
somewhere, but not sure what. Now, we hadn't changed anything in our own code remotely related to metrics, so fair assumption is it must be something in a library update, because I did update to a newer dot something version of Spring Boot. Um, so the first thing I did was I enabled debug logging. What is really nice about Macrometer is um, it has a debug logging that you can simply enable to see what is happening. And if you have the actuator active, you can actually enable things like debug logging on the fly for every Spring Boot service. Right? So enabling debugging is something that is quite easy. And you should always make sure that it is quite easy for your production environment to debug these sorts of issues. So I did. And I, I caught some logs from the old service to see this is what it actually exports to the Datadog API. And I got some logs from the new version of that service. And I thought, OK, I'm just going to do a diff, and I'll see what's, what the problem is. But they were the same, really. There were no significant differences between the old logs sent to, or not to the logs, but the calls being made to Datadog and the new ones. They were really the same thing. But still, the old, pro the old service didn't have this problem. So then I started to read documentation, right? That's last resort always, read documentation. And it turns out that the, uh, the Datadog API actually had a field, which is called host where you can set the name of the host. And I noticed that we weren't sending it. That sounds like a thing that could actually explain something, right? I have a lot of metrics from different instances running on different hosts, but I'm not actually sending the host. So maybe somehow they were overriding each other. Um, so that was a theory. Still, it didn't explain why the problem hadn't existed before. But still, I had something to go on. But um, so I joined the micrometer Slack form, um, calling out for medic, basically. And I explained the problem, and I said, well, uh, I have already seen that uh, when I actually uh, add the host, and you can do that in Macrometer by adding an instance, um, it works. So now instead of wondering why, didn't, why, why was this broken all of a sudden, I thought, well, how did this ever work before? Right? Th you probably recognize this. If you're doing IT for longer than a year, you will be in this situation where you think, how the hell did this ever work? Um, so I started to think about this. and. Um, I said, well, the only, the only theory I can come up with is that somehow, with this new release, all of these metrics started publishing at the same second. Because, and then Datadog says, oh, if they're reported in the same second and there is no host, uh, then it must be the same thing. So it, it ends up overriding something. And there was a guy there trying to help me out. And he said, well, I, I looked through the commits in Micrometer, uh, because I said I went from 1.6 to 1.8, but I don't see anything there. But it, it, I couldn't find anything else. So uh, this is the stuff that keeps me awake at night. So I actually dove, dove into the code myself of Macrometer and all of the commits. And for sure, I did find an issue where they said, hey, we have this thing where we need to publish things in the right order. And the easiest way to do this is to just always publish things on the same second. And this was a change that was introduced in Macrometer 1.7. And for sure, we upgraded from 1.6 to 1.8. So that perfectly explained the problem. So I had basically uncovered a latent bug that had always been in our application for four years already. We just never noticed it until we deployed this new version. And it turns out then, of course, that uh, our other project uh, had exactly the same issue. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we were the first one to upgrade, so I fixed that for them. Um, so really important here, whenever you're publishing metrics for something that runs more than one instance, add an instance tag. And this is the code that you can use for that. This is uh, taken from our production code. Uh, it's uh, like a condensed version. You see that uh, we have this meter registry customizer that adds three values, three tags or dimensions, as they're actually called, uh, to all of our metrics. We include the name of the service. We include the AWS region. Uh, but most importantly, what we didn't do, and now we do, is we added the instance. And in our case, everything in Kubernetes just has a host name within the container that is unique. So you can just take that one, and that's as easy as it is to fix this particular issue. Also, follow where the data takes you, right? Um, I, I, it, it's like House MD, right? I'm sure you're all familiar with the series, right? Once he has this theory and all of the data fits, it must be that. This was like that. It must, th there is no other way than to explain this stuff than it must have been publishing on the same second, even though it seems unlikely. I couldn't explain why. So believe in that stuff and persist then to find the root cause because you want to understand these sort of issues properly and not just say, well, I think I fixed it. I'm not even sure how it got fixed or why it was broken, because it, it's just guaranteed to bite you back in the ass some other time. So final case that I have for you to present is uh, not related to health this time, um, but to memory. 
And I've called this one out of my mind, and this is actually from uh, Apocalypse Now, as you may know, the horror. Um, we had a service that would sometimes go out of memory as it was stressed. And there can be many reasons for that, right? There can be a memory leak in your own code, it could be something else. Maybe it wasn't even a memory leak, um, but we, all, we, we had a look. And this thing ran as a container on ECS, um, and whenever it would go out of memory, it would dump a, a heap dump. Um, and this service was mostly just doing transformations, it was forwarding some calls, it wasn't really anything special, so I didn't really have like an obvious idea, oh, this is where, probably where the leak is. So what was causing these out of memories then? And um, we are running our services actually on OpenJ9, which is a, 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 a based on an IBM uh, Java virtual machine, which is really more efficient when it comes to things like memory, and it creates its own format for heap dumps. Um, and that should provide me with some info, but the problem is we were running on ECS, so the first problem is how I'm actually gonna obtain the dump, because it writes it to the local file system, but that's in the container, and then typically the container actually gets killed or stopped after some out of memory errors. Um, but in this case, I was lucky enough that we were running on EC2 actually, and running our own containers on top of that, so I could SSH onto the host, and then use a Docker command line client, and then do some Docker copy magic to actually extract the heap dumps out of the stopped container. And uh, that was more luck, really, than wisdom that I was able to do this, because we hadn't really thought about this use case. Uh, and you have to be quick to do this as well, because the stopped containers will be cleaned up automatically by uh, some daemon in the, uh, in the platform. Uh, but uh, for sure, what we did is uh, we configured an alert so that if there was an out of memory, we would immediately get a, an alert, quickly SSH into the server, and for sure, I was able to obtain a heap dump. And then you have to put it in a tool. So for that, you can actually use this thing. This is called the Eclipse Memory Analyzer. It needs a plugin for the uh, heap dump format of OpenJ9, but once you put that in, I uh, did some analysis, and it, uh, it's just a push of a button, and it then shows you some suspect data. And what you can see here, this is my entire heap, and like this part of the heap was just used by a single linked list. So I had found a smoking gun. And um, it turned out, that's, um, that linked list was actually held by something from a, a library called syslog4j, which uh, has a TCP net syslog writer. So I, I found the issue. Um, we were using syslog4j as a logback appender because we needed to inform some security system whenever um, users were trying to log into our system. And regardless of whether that was successful or not, we had to inform them and we, their protocol was syslog. And actually logback has a built-in syslog appender but it only supports UDP, I needed TCP, so I looked on the internet, and I took the first one that looked legit, which was syslog4j, that indeed supported this. Um, we did configure it with async forwarding, right? I don't want that thing to start blocking when things are busy, a lot of users are trying to log in. So it can do it asynchronously, it can do it on a separate thread, and my assumption was, yeah, people who built this have thought about this stuff, so they're probably uh, just gonna have some built-in uh, buffer, right, to uh, discard any traffic if it's too big, but they didn't. They had an unbound linked list. So if there is one thing that is always a bad idea, it's unbounded queues, and it's even worse if you implement that queue as a linked list, by the way. Um, so that, that dump that I just showed you, it showed that we had like 123,000 linked list nodes with data at the time of the dump. So don't assume, right? Um, so I rewrote the code. Um, and I fixed it by actually implementing a, a fixed buffer. And I said, well, that's probably gonna be enough. So I was making another assumption, but this time I wanted to make sure we could check it. So I had a buffer in there of 75,000, right? If I crash with 123, I can probably handle 75. But I added a micrometer counter. And that micrometer counter was actually telling me every time that I would discard something, just incrementing. It doesn't cost any memory, but at least I can see it happens. This is a Dutch expression, and as doesn't generally stumble upon the same stone twice, that was me there, being smart with my, me with my metric. So it turned out I did indeed fix the out of memory, but uh, we were discarding way more logins uh, or syslog events than we thought, and our security officer wasn't really happy with that. But I could see that because of the, the, meter, the meter that I introduced. So uh, eventually we just ended up putting all of this stuff in a real queue. Uh, we use SQS from AWS, and then we just pull the queue and we forward these things in our own tempo, which prevents us from going out of memory. So lessons learned, open source libraries do have bugs, right? They're not written by people who are somehow better than you and me, and very often they're just scratching an itch and they will throw the thing on GitHub. Um, so um, make sure to test your assumptions there, 
also ensure that you have access to stuff like thread dumps and heap dumps if they happen. Because otherwise, you won't be able to analyze any of this, and you will be forever in the dark on why your services are crashing. Um, and make sure, if you are building in stuff like the assumptions that I had, to, um, to have something like metrics in there, so you can actually verify those assumptions. That really helped us in this case, and it's, it's just a couple of lines of code, really. So to conclude, um, as you probably knew already, staging won't show you all of the issues that your application uh, can have, and some things will only show up in production. Right? That is life. Josh Long likes to say production is the happiest place on Earth, but it can be brutal if you're not careful. Um, so ensure that you have good observability. Ensure that you can actually see what is happening. That is the key to solving all of these issues. You need to see what is happening so that you can do an analysis and a fix. Understand how your application interacts with the platform, right? Things like health checks, how are they actually being used? Don't be afraid to read code of, uh, of libraries uh, uh, that you're using and, and learn from my mistakes so that you can make your own mistakes in production. With that, thank you very much for attending.